everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I see some old faces. There's a former student here, so I'll be cold calling you, Vincent. You better be ready. Uh, no, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I was actually here about six years ago, and it's wonderful to be back. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be a, a bit of a provocateur, I hope, and get you to think about things in perhaps a different way. I want to challenge you to think about this question. And when I ask it, I've been asking this question a lot now. People have been asking me. I've been asking them. We've been having all kinds of interesting conversations. Are you leading the life you want? Most people say no. Uh, so that seems sad to me. And uh, it creates all kinds of opportunities for all of us to rethink, well, what does it mean to be leading the life you want? What do we know from research in leadership development and in work-life integration, which I've been doing for uh, almost three decades now? What do we know about how to bring together the different parts of life for mutual gain? And what I hope to do in this next 45 minutes or so is to give you some ideas, some models, and some tools that you can use so that you leave here with uh, a specific plan for something that you're going to do that's new, that you design to make things better in the different parts of your life. So I want this to be practical. This is not just going to be me talking. In fact, at a certain point very soon, I'm going to ask you to take out your smartphones or your computers and go to a site online and do a, an 18 item uh, assessment. That'll take you about three minutes, which will uh, hopefully uh, provoke your thinking further. So thank you so much again, Ashley, for, for inviting me and to all of you for coming. Um, let's, let's start with this question, because this is about leadership and it's about work-life integration. It's really a marriage of those two fields, my approach. When I ask you this question, what comes to mind? What's your response in a, in a word or phrase? Bless you. Creative. Creative, yeah, OK. What else? What other thoughts? Sorry? Gutsy. Gutsy. Flexible. Sorry? Flexible. Flexible, yeah. That's the one I've been asking this question many, many times now over the last few years in talks um, about leadership from the point of view of the whole person. And that's the one I hear most no matter where I go, whether it's in Santiago, Chile, or in Paris, or in Brooklyn. It's, yeah, it's, it's the need to be adaptive and creative. Feminine. Sorry? Feminine. Feminine. I, I, I don't usually hear that, Gopi. Um, but I, I think you know, the, the bringing together of the masculine and the feminine and, and of embracing many different worldviews. Well, this is, I want to start to get your mental juices flowing here, thinking about the concept of leadership and what it means to you. Because the models for leadership that most of us grew up with as children are no longer fitting for the world as it is. And so we need to rethink. So let me just take a, a little bit of a, um, a, a backwards view. Uh, how has the world shifted even over the 30 years that I've been teaching at the Wharton School? That's correct, 30 years. You can give me some love for that. <laughs> 30 years, please. Vincent, come on. Things have changed a lot. So all kinds of societal shifts. Uh, and we've been studying at Wharton for decades now how attitudes and values of people uh, at, at our school and, and elsewhere are changing. And of course, they're radical. Uh, the changes of uh, the roles of women in society, of um, the, the, the nature of work, what people expect of work. This, as you can see, if you see that young man in the middle there, do you recognize him? That's me 20 years ago well, in one of our early conferences on h how to integrate work in the rest of life. So we've been at this for a long time. And we, we went into the field to look for models. Who's doing this well? Who's integrating the different parts of their lives in a way that works for them and for their businesses and for their uh, families and communities? And how do they do it? Uh, so that's what I'm here to, to share with you, the fruits of that research and, and where that has gone. But, so many changes in terms of what people expect of work. Uh, one of the questions we've been asking for years is, uh, do you uh, expect to work at the same company when you graduate as when you retire? So I've been asking this since the mid-'80s of, of Wharton students. Back in the mid-'80s, what do you think the uh, percentage of people who said, yeah, that's my plan. I'm going to work in the same company? It was about 70%. Uh, and. Uh, uh, a while ago, not, not too long ago, I asked the same question of a group of uh, 70 fresh-faced MBA students. How many of you plan to go to the same be in the same company your whole career? How many hands do you think went up? Well, there were two. There were two, and, and they were both heirs to major fortunes. So, 
all kinds of changes in mobility. People expect to move, as probably most of you do. Um, and naturally, the digital age has changed everything about the nature of human communication and how we build trust. And most importantly, as you think about yourself as a leader, and that's who I see when I look out on this room, is a group of developing leaders. So this is not about a position in a hierarchy. It's really about you as a person and how you mobilize people toward goals that matter. The big question is, what do you focus your attention on? And that's become a lot harder thing to, to manage in the digital age when you know, the, the pull for your attention is, is sitting either you know, close to your heart or in your back pocket all the time. So now, in the modern world, the boundaries between work and the rest of life are no longer uh, on the basis of the natural flow of seasons and time and the sun rising and the sun setting. It's all internal. You choose when to turn it on, when to turn it off. Completely new, none of us grew up with that. Uh, so learning how to respond to that and globalization, so many other aspects have changed the leadership landscape which requires us to think differently about what we mean by leadership. So that's where I want to start. It's just shake up your thinking a bit. Yeah, what I learned as a kid probably doesn't hold anymore yet. I still probably have it in my head. So we went out into the field and found or what is it that people do who are successful. And we found that there are these, these three principles that they follow. Uh, and they seem to be kind of universal across business sectors and indeed across country, uh, countries. They, and I wrote about this in a book called Total Leadership, which really is the story of this course that I created initially at Ford Motor Company. So in 1999, I, I went uh, to Ford Motor Company for two and a half years. I left Wharton and was head of leadership development there. And there we had an opportunity to create some new, some new ways of learning leadership. And that's where we created Total Leadership, which is about how to produce mutual gains all right, in all the different parts. How to improve performance at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself. So it's about what I call four-way wins, which were a lot, uh, are a lot more available to everyone than most people think. Most people think you have to balance and trade off. And that is the wrong way to think about the relationship between work and life. Because when you think about balance, you think, well, my career's getting better. I'm getting a lot more money, um, a lot more authority, a lot more opportunities for creative action. And what's wrong with this picture? Didn't start with it. So, something, say it again. You didn't start with it. You didn't start with, with what? <laughs> Ah, yeah, so it's, it's only after a certain amount of time. But what, what I mainly wanted to point to was the fact that if you think about the scales and balance and one going up and the other going down, it, it, it connotes this notion of trading off all the time. And that's your mental frame. You're thinking, I have to give something up in order to gain. And what I want to challenge here is the idea that uh, that doesn't have to always be true. Of course, sacrifice is necessary. Of course, there's going to be disappointment, even tragedy. Uh, but in what we've, what we've seen now through many years of, of work in, an, in uh, a number of different organizations and with students is that it's, if you pursue, if you look for opportunities to make things better in all the different parts, it's a lot more likely that you can do that than if you assume you can't. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to think about these different domains, work, home, community, and self, and, and what they mean to you. And so what I described in, uh, in, this, in this book was this step-by-step -step course, a, a program really, that took about four months. And it starts with being real. So that's the first principle. What matters most to you? How do you act with authenticity? By clarifying what matters most to you, so your values, your vision. You spend some time writing about that, thinking about that, talking about that with peers. What does it mean to be whole, to respect the whole, to act with integrity by bringing the pieces together as one? So the root of the term integrity is one, integer, coherence. And there it's a matter of respecting the whole person by identifying who matters most to you in the different parts of your life, at work, at home, in the community. Who are those people? Why are they important to you? What do they expect of you? What do you expect of them? And then speaking to them about your mutual expectations, clarifying them through conversation, which also takes a few weeks and is pretty intense. Uh, and from all of that kind of diagnostic work, coming up with ideas for innovation. 
being innovative, acting with creativity by experimenting continually with how things get done. So there's a period of a month or two where you do experiments that you design that are intended to pursue four-way wins. And you measure the results and you reflect on what works and what doesn't and learn some new things about what's possible in terms of your creating change in your world that's sustainable because it works not just for you, not just for your business, not just for your home, not just for your family, but for all the different parts. Well, um, <clears throat> reflecting on that, you draw insights for how you can take these ideas further and discover more uh, such opportunities for creating meaningful change in, in your world. But the problem with this is that it takes about four months. Uh, and, and, and people were saying to me, well, what if I don't want the whole meal if I just want to go to the buffet and just take a little piece here and there? Uh, right now, uh, I'm teaching this course uh, on a MOOC on Coursera. And uh, we've got almost 90,000 people that have enrolled in this class. So it's, it's happening all over the world. Uh, but that's a 10-week process, and not everybody's willing to invest. So one of the reasons why I wrote the current book was to create a, a way that people could sample and access content in a, in, a, in a faster, easier way. But the more pressing point was this question that I got wherever I went from super high achievers. And that is, well, come on, Stu. To be really successful, don't you have to sacrifice everything? And the answer is no. Now, you might think of people who were contrary to that. But I, 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 I urge you to think about what success means for them and for you. And you might be quite skeptical right now as I'm speaking and thinking, well, yeah, well, Stu, you don't really understand. You don't get it. You don't know my family. You don't know my business life. You don't know my career. You don't know where I come from. You don't know what I'm trying. Well, of course, I know none of those things. But what I'm asking you to do for this next half hour or so is just keep an open mind and see where this takes you and thinking about um, what might be possible for you to take yourself to the next level that you haven't thought about. So the current book is a response to those two needs, something faster and easier, and to help to demonstrate that, in fact, the people who are most successful are those who don't forsake the other parts of their lives, but rather embrace them. And that's what I want to tell you about here and hopefully inspire you and, and perhaps instruct you on how you can develop greater capacity for doing the same thing. Let me ask you to think about this chart here. Uh, you don't have to write anything. I just want you to think about this. So I'm going to ask you to take a quick snapshot of what I'll call the four-way view. So you've got these four domains, however you want to define them, work, home, community, and self. If you were to take 100 points and allocate them according to right now how important each domain is to you, how would you allocate those 100 points? Just think about that for a sec. Now, think about your waking time during a typical week. Where is your attention? Because now we're, we're talking about your attention, right? Because you can, this is your most precious asset. Not just your physical presence, but your psychological presence, which are two different things. What did I just say? What exactly did I just say? Can you repeat what I just said? The second sentence? Close. Paraphrase. Well, you were, well the, the idea was to see the difference between the, 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 the focus you put yes. on, the, on the different, on the, on the four categories and the real importance you, you give to that. OK, that's, that's what I had just asked you to do. So you're paying attention. So you're, you're physically present and psychologically present. Maybe not everyone here is. But you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to manage those boundaries. I want you to think about where is your head at when you're awake, according to these four domains. So you take another 100 points and allocate them according to where your mind is. All right, and now I want you to think quickly now, what would you say about how satisfied you are, your sense of well-being, and I know that you do this here, uh, and that you're, you're, you, know, you, you ask yourself these questions as part of uh, your, your regular survey process. So you've probably thought about this. How well are things going for you at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, from not at all to wonderfully satisfied? And then finally, think about how well things are going from the perspective of other people. 
So if I were to have a conversation, Vincent, with the, the five people who know you best at, at Google, and, and I were to ask them, how's Google, how is Vincent doing in meeting your expectations for performance? On average, Vincent, on a scale of one, poorly, 10, outstandingly, and I expect since you were such an outstanding student in my class 20 years ago that it would be a total 10, but maybe not. What would they say? You don't have to answer this. But I would like you, you probably all know this. Think about how the same question would go if we asked members of your family. And in your community, your friends, neighbors, social groups, what have you. And then for yourself, your own performance in meeting your own goals for your intellectual development, your spiritual growth, your emotional health, your physical health. All right, so this, this snapshot is the four-way view. And we typically do this at the beginning of this, this four-month program. Uh, and now what I want to show you is what happens, what people report, and this is a study of about 300 of them uh, who did this uh, program not, not that long ago. Uh, four months later, when they completed the same brief uh, assessment. All right, so let's, let's look at what has changed. So comparing uh, the ratings, this is the average ratings for how important the different domains are <coughs> before and after. What do you see? Are we on the beach? <laughs> we are on the beach. Um, about the same, yeah, exactly the same, right? So this, you know, there's no, uh, there's no drugs here. This is not a cult. You, 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 there's no surgery. There's no. Uh, you, your values are your values. They don't shift. What does shift, though, as we as we compare uh, the tension uh, on average, where it goes before and after? What do you see? What what has shifted? It gets closer. And how does that happen? Take away from work. Take away from work, right? And that's, that's what happens. When you ask people to focus on, you know, to discover more about what they care about, what the people around them need most from them, and then experiment with how to get things done that are good for them and good for you, what typically happens is some of the, shift, some of the attention shifts away from work and towards the other domains. And often when I present this to senior executives, someone in the back of the room will say to her neighbor, who is this jerk and why did we bring him here? I, I don't understand what we're talking about. Why would we, I mean, is this what they're teaching at Wharton now? Uh, <clears throat> less attention to work, why would we want that? Well, we want that because uh, if you look at the, the results in terms of improvements in satisfaction and performance to a lesser degree, as, as assessed by the people, those are delta percentages, um, that 8%, assuming these data are valid, that's a positive number. So. How do you explain that? Less attention to work, better satisfaction across the board, and improved performance at work. Less attention, improved performance. That seems paradoxical. How do you explain it? What's your theory? Maybe when you, you take care of things outside of work, you are less distracted when you're at work. That's, that's one of the things that we see time and time again. Less distraction, better ability to focus. Any other reasons why you might see this result? Yeah. Sir? Because they have dropped their standards on measurement. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, the measures change. And we ask about that. Yeah. So you're, you become more realistic about what other people expect of you. So it's easier to meet those expectations once you realize that they're not as high as you thought. Yes, which in itself is quite liberating when you think about it. Uh, so yeah, you get a more realistic picture of what others expect of you. Other ideas? One specific example of this that I found is that if I take the time to work out in the middle of the day, I feel like I have more mental focus in the latter half of the day. Yeah. The afternoon delays. Well, your brain is working differently. Like yeah. So, and that, like the runner's high, yes, that does affect your performance. And, we, and one of the most common kinds of experiments that people do is that they do physical activity or they change their diet so as to make things better, not just for their f physical health, their me mental functioning, but their performance as assessed by others at work, as well as at home, as well as in the community. So there are some obvious reasons why you'd see positive gains. Well, so that's one way in which I'm trying to address the skeptics, but it's usually not enough. They want to know, how do I, you know, 
conquer the world and do all this other stuff, all this nice stuff that you're talking about, Professor Airhead. Doesn't really know anything about the real world. But in fact, I was a senior executive at a big company for a few years, so I have some idea. Well, that motivated me to want to go out and find stories of super successful people, by most standards, by any standard, and to discover in their stories how they did it. And so I've got hundreds and hundreds of biographies that students have written and that I have investigated. And in this book, Leading the Life You Want, Skills for Integrating Work and Life, I've distilled it down to six people, some of whom you know well, some of whom you haven't heard of. And let me just tell you who they are, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how they got there and what you can learn from their model. So Tom Tierney, any of you know who Tom Tierney is? The, the, yes, he was the former CEO of Bain. And, and it, in the, his mid-40s, in the late 90s, he quit as CEO of Bain and started up a uh, bridge span, which was a, an offshoot that brought Bain's consulting services to the social sector. Um, now, Cheryl Sandberg, I know you all know, she used to work here. Uh, and I, you know, four years ago, when she first got on my radar screen, she wasn't a household name as she is now. Uh, so there's probably not much more I can tell you about her story, although there might be, um, because you know, my interview with her for this book revealed some things that you might find interesting. Um, Eric Greitens, who knows Eric Greitens? Okay, Eric Greitens is um, the youngest of the group. He was a humanitarian, a Rhodes Scholar, a uh, humanitarian worker in the 90s, went to war-torn areas, drug-infested areas to basically feed children and protect people. Uh, but wasn't really protecting them. In fact, realized that the heart is not enough, that when bad guys are out there, you need a fist too, so to protect people uh, who are being um, hurt. So he became a Navy SEAL in his late 20s and then was deployed uh, in the Middle East three times, won a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star. And when he came back, he created an organization called The Mission Continues, which helps wounded veterans heal by giving them opportunities to serve here back at home. Remarkable story. Michelle Obama, most of you know who she is, uh, but you may not know about her story and how she got to where she is. Uh, Julie Foudy, soccer fans? Hello? No? She's the co-captain of the uh, women's national team that won the World Cup in the 90s and two Olympic gold medals. Uh, but she's in this book not because of her prowess on the field, but rather because of her leadership in women's sports to create parity between men and women in soccer, and also for her founding the uh, Sports Leadership Academy, which empowers girls uh, to become great leaders through soccer. Uh, and finally, Bruce Springsteen. Most of you are too young to know who Bruce Springsteen is, probably. <laughs> <laughs> He's the oldest of the lot, uh, rock icon, true leader. OK, so what can we learn from these people? Uh, how did they get there? Now I want you to um, actually take out your machines and, and go to this site because there's an 18-item self-assessment there that's going to introduce you to the skills that these people have used. So I've taken those three principles of be real, be whole, be innovative, and broken them down into skills that anybody can learn. So first place to start is assess yourself on these skills. So tell me if you have any problem getting to this site, which is qualtrics.com slash total leadership. Now, if you need a paper version of this, Ashley has a copy. Do you, anybody need paper? Did you get who you're most like? Yeah. Who are you most like? Becca? You want to guess? No, no, no. There's no way I'm guessing. Okay. I don't know you. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama, OK. Um, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> Cheryl, any Eric's out there? Excellent. Tom? Tommy T? Let me tell you what, these, uh, what, what this means. Um, can I move on? Who needs more time? Raise your hand. OK, take another 30 seconds. True. Hey, it's <laughs> No, we're just finishing up a little exercise here at this site, which you can do later. It's great to see you. 
Eric, is there an Eric here? And a Julie. Okay, so I've, everybody's represented. All right, so the way this, this uh, simple, um, it's really just to pique your interest. Uh, the way this works is that um, your strengths are most like these three people, uh, the, the three skills that are particularly uh, exemplary in these six people. So let me just go through those really quickly. So, so what, I, what I do in the book is I, I write, uh, I've written New Yorker style profiles of each of these six people which you will find riveting reading, I'm certain, 100%. Um, so if you like stories, you know, the stories are fun. But then after each story, I analyze them in, in terms of these skills. Uh, like, how did they cultivate these skills? And what does it tell us about how you can? And then in the back half of the book, and we're going to get to that in a second, there's a, a bunch of exercises that I've curated from modern research in psychology and related fields uh, for, that you can pick and choose to focus on uh, developing the skills that are important to you. And we're going to do one of those here before we're done. So with Tierney, for example, envision your legacy, really important skill. This is a guy who uh, has, since his early days as a young adult, has been journaling and reflecting quite regularly and almost obsessively on his life. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Am I going in a direction that makes sense to me? And back in the 80s, he came up with this idea of what he called a make a difference company. He knew he wanted to create a company that was going to make a difference in society. But he didn't know exactly what that looked like. So he talked about it, and the idea germinated, germinated. It was 15 years later that Bridge Band began. But he had in mind this idea of envisioning his legacy. He's also really good at weaving the different span, strands of his life together. And, and being creative about seeing new ways of doing things. But let's just uh, focus on, those, on the, that first one for now. With Sandberg, uh, as she told me, the first draft of Lean In, which has sold how many books? Two and a half million? Uh, the first draft of that, her husband, uh, who you, you may also know, David Goldberg, the CEO of, of Surfing Monkey, told her, nobody's going to want to read this. It's really boring. Uh, why was it boring? Well, it was, it was, it was quite astute with respect to the research on unconscious bias and the things that hold women back at work and in society. But what it was lacking was any heart and soul or story. And yet, it was when she kind of came out at Barnard in the commencement speech of 2011 and told her story that people really started paying attention to her. So she, she's a natural storyteller. And it, indeed, by then forcing herself to bring those stories into the narrative, that that book really came alive and indeed launched uh, a, a kind of social movement. Um, she's also exceptionally good and exemplary at building networks with the women of Silicon Valley uh, and being creative about resolving conflicts between the different parts of her life in what seems very clearly to be a 50-50 relationship with her husband. All right, Eric Greitens, I told you something about him. Um, he is, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine a better example of somebody holding himself accountable for what he really believed in. Because when he was confronted with the idea that uh, I've got to protect these people, not just feed them. So what does that mean? Well, it means I need to become a Navy SEAL to be a fighter so that I can actually do that. That's really holding yourself accountable. But he's also very good at taking what he had cultivated in one part of his life how he learned about human resilience in these terrible circumstances and how people survive by serving others, and applying that in the founding of The Mission Continues. That's the founding idea. People, wounded veterans, want to continue to serve. Let's create opportunities for them to do that. And that's what The, the Mission Continues is, and indeed the first fellow, and now there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, who are placed in, play, in, in settings where they can be of service. The very first one is Chris Marvin. He was a student in my class four years ago, and that's how I found out about, about Eric's amazing story. Michelle Obama, you know, none of these people went to private school or you know, grew up with a lot of money. Uh, they made themselves into who they are. Now, they, they did have luck. They had you know, talent, for sure. Uh, but you know, what to me is inspiring about these stories is that they took themselves further, and they are avid about continually learning. And that's certainly true of Obama, whose story is especially interesting when you think about how she has managed the boundaries among the different parts of her life. When she first moved to the White House, 
uh, and, and how she created uh, you know, as close to normal an environment for her kids, which was super important. And how she's done that and how they have done that as a family is really quite instructive. Um, Julie Foudy, uh, when, when she saw that the men were getting a better deal than the women in, in, in soccer, she stood up and said, that can't be. And she got the support of people like Billie Jean King and others to figure out a way to stand up to challenge the status quo. Um, based on her knowledge, really cultivated by her parents, that you have to know what really matters to yourself. Uh, finally, Bruce, why is Bruce in this? Well, not only am I a, a, you know, a lifelong fan, but he's also a really good exemplar of these, these skills of being yourself wherever you go, of being very clear with other people what matters to you and listening to them, including his audience, and responding to them them all the time, and uh, he's a teacher. If you watch his, his 2012 um, keynote at South by Southwest, it, it's really remarkable, a history of rock and roll and what he's trying to teach young musicians about what, what the field is all about. Um, but he's also, in, if you look at if you, the, the video of uh, the 2014 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony, his bandmate and friend uh, Steve Van Zandt says to him, you know, 65 years old this guy is, and he's got bigger, you know, global market share than he's ever had in his life. They just continue to grow. Why is that? Because he's constantly pushing, you know, the boundaries of his creative talent. And he makes other people around him do the same. He creates cultures of innovation. All right, so these is a very quick snapshot of what these skills are, what it means to be real, to know what matters, to be those values wherever you are, to drive to align what you do with what you care about and to convey what matters to you through stories. To be able to envision your future and hold yourself accountable for pursuing what matters most. To be whole, clarifying what it means, you know, what matters most to you, to be helping other people all the time so that you're building supportive networks and taking what you have in one part of your life and applying it in the others and being smart about how you manage boundaries. Uh, sometimes that means creating firm boundaries where you focus just on one person or one thing at a time. Other times it means merging them. But it's all about conscious, deliberate choice and experimentation. And weaving the different pieces together in a way that works for you and for them. To be innovative means focusing on results and letting the means for their achievement happen flexibly among the people around you. To be creative about resolving conflicts where you see a conflict look differently at the situation. Where is there an opportunity for this to be a win-win? And to be looking back and saying, we don't have to do it that way, and looking forward and saying, how can we do it some way different? And having the courage and support to try new ways of getting things done. And finally, to be teaching other people all the time. So these are the skills. This is a little overwhelming. Don't freak out. What I want you to do is think about one of these right now. The one that is most important for you to focus on now, based on what you were just thinking about, perhaps as you were listening to me talk about these six remarkable people, or in the self-assessment you just did, if you had to choose one that you could strengthen, choose one. And then what I would like you to do is, is actually come up with an idea for how you could do that. And then talk about it with somebody else in the room that you're willing to talk to about this. So here's, here's, here's what I'm asking you to do. It's real simple. I think you will benefit from this, so give it a shot, OK? <clears throat> Which is the most important one for you to focus on? What could you do right now that would make you stronger on that skill? What action could you take in the next week or so? Be creative. And finally, if you did this thing, this new thing that would strengthen this skill, what impact would that have on your work, either now or in the long game, maybe over the course of your whole life? Because that's how I think about the integration of the different parts, not balance minute to minute. That's impossible. Forget that. Think instead about harmony over the course of your whole life, as these people have, and as all of us have the capacity to do at home, in the community, and for yourself, where would be the positive impact of this thing that you might try that would strengthen that skill that's important to you?
You can sketch out a note about this. This is actually what's on the back of the handout, but you probably don't need it. There is a handout. Do you have it? So to just take a minute to think about what could I do? What could I do now that would strengthen the skill that matters much to me? And what positive impact would that have on the different parts? All right, so just take a minute to think of an idea. It can be half formed. All right, so here's what I'd like you to do. Do you have an idea? Not yet? You're, you're still thinking? I want you to think with somebody else. Somebody who you, preferably, who you don't know, that would be better. So what I'd like you to do for the next five minutes, find a discussion partner, preferably someone you do not know, it's better that way, and be more fun, uh, where you take a few minutes, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think, and, and she does the same. Is this something you're willing to do? Okay, it's, it's really simple. So at your, your, your coaching here, right? So all you have to do is, you know, how would practicing this skill create a greater sense of harmony among the different parts and improve all of them? And what, what exactly would you be doing here? And, and how would you know this was improving your performance? So just ask those questions, pay attention, give someone else the gift of your caring attention for just a few minutes. How can you help each other going forward? Uh, I can tell you how. If you talk to each other occasionally, maybe just you know text or you know a quick hello. How's that idea going? Are you doing it? This is really important, and I know this from literally decades of trying to do this kind of work. You cannot do it on your own, and if you have somebody else who's interested and wants to help you and learn by teaching you, uh, you stay connected somehow in a very light way. It doesn't have to be you know deep long conversation. Just continue to pay attention. I hope you will continue that. Let me give you a really quick overview of the three dozen exercises that are in the back half of the book that you can choose from to focus on these skills. So there's two exercises that I've, again, curated from the literature on how you create positive change uh, for each one of the skills. So I'll just mention a couple of them and then we'll wrap up. So one of my favorites is find the larger meaning uh, in terms of trying to align your actions with your values. And all that really asks you to do, it's pretty simple, is think about what's the big purpose of what you're trying to do with your work every day. A lot of people don't think about that. And when you do, you see a greater a connection between what you're doing, or you, you can find a greater connection between what you're doing every day and uh, what is really important to you. Uh, autobiography, that's also pretty straightforward. Uh, and if you want to get good at conveying your values through stories, which other people want to hear from you because they want to see you as a human being, just like them, someone who has struggled to try to achieve something that matters and has faced adversity and somehow surmounted it, you reflect on the two or three or four critical episodes of your life history that have shaped who you are. And then figure out a way to convey those, if you're willing, to people who would be interested in hearing about them as a way of uh, conveying, again, what matters most to you. Time travel is another cool thing to do. It's 15 years from now. Describe a day in the life. What happens? Who, do you, who are you with when you wake up? What are you doing? What impact are you having on the world? So those are some simple exercises to do to help you to get better at acting with authenticity by clarifying what matters most to you. Uh, for being whole, a couple of exercises that you might want to try. We heard something just like this now, the segment and merge uh, exercise. So here, what you do is take, take some, some way in which the two parts of your life, or three or four of them, uh, intersect, and try segmenting them. And that's kind of what you just did here. Bounding time and place for just one thing. And it could be just for five minutes or it could be for a day, or it could be for a week. But try segmenting and just in, in, in a way that you haven't before so that you can bring total focus to one person or thing. See what happens. 
And then try the opposite. Try bringing together two parts of your life that normally would be very separated and what happens there. And what you discover by consciously and deliberately experimenting with segmenting and merging is how to be smarter about creating those boundaries. It really just takes stepping back, experimenting, and then seeing what happens and then learning from that. So those are, um, th those are some ideas about being whole. Now, exercises for practicing some of the skills of being innovative. I'll just mention two and then we'll wrap up. Um, crowdsourcing solutions. So if, um, you know, most people in this room, I suspect, are probably pretty creative, but sometimes you get stuck and you, you, you see a dilemma and you just can't find a solution. A really simple way to do this, and you probably do this in your work life pretty regularly, bring together a couple of people who, are, who you trust and you're willing to talk about opportunities for alternatives and generate creative solutions with them. So you crowdsource solutions to problems that you're facing in the different parts of your life. And finally, challenging your beliefs. Uh, research uh, on, on um, behavioral uh, therapy for depression, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, is uh, quite profound insights from that literature, which show that a lot of uh, what holds people back from trying something new that's going to make them feel a greater sense of control in their lives is their beliefs about what might happen if they did try something new. And if you challenge those, and the exercise that I describe in the book helps you to just in a simple way look at the beliefs that you have about a certain course of action, it actually minimizes your own resistance and, and your fear. Uh, there's lots more, but we're, we're reaching the end of the hour. Um, I, I hope that these ideas have, uh, have, have, have sparked your thinking about what you can do uh, to build the capacity to bring together the different parts of your life. Let me just ask you really quickly, um, what do you take away from what, what we've been talking about here, what I've been saying for the last hour or so? What's the big idea for you? What's action. the Action. That's it. Do something. it just do about. something. Yes. Yeah, so I, I begin the first, the, the second part of the book after telling the stories with, you know, when you read these stories, you'll see the thing that comes through is just this idea. They don't, people, these people don't sit still. They're moving, moving all the time and then reflecting on what it is that they're learning from their action. What else do you take away? Small changes. Small changes towards a big idea. It's something we all know intuitively, uh, and it's within everyone's grasp. And that's the beauty of small, that you, know, you make it small enough so that other people aren't terrified by what you're trying, and they see that, in fact, what you're trying to do is good for them, too, assuming it is. And of course, that's part of what you think about here when you take the four-way view. What else? Let's get one more. Yeah. There's no such thing as balance. All right, that's that's a fitting uh, a fitting. I mean, you can talk about balance, but it's 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 misguided. The metaphor I prefer prefer is the uh, the jazz quartet. So you got these four instruments, right? And they're improvising on a theme over the course of your whole life. You're trying to make beautiful music, but sometimes you only hear the trumpet, right? Sometimes maybe it's only family or it's only work. Sometimes you just hear the bass and the drums. It doesn't have to all be at the same amplitude at the same time. Um, thinking instead about harmony over the long, the long haul, that's what these folks have done. They also prove that achievement, significant achievement in the world, comes from taking action, taking compassionate action that's designed to take whatever is unique about you, your passions, your skills, your talents, and bringing them to bear in a positive way on the world around you. That's what each of these people has done. And if you think about the people you admire who have had lives of significance, I'm pretty sure they will have done the same thing. So the paradox of the title is that leading the life you want requires striving all the time to be helping other people. That's what's liberating, is the idea of taking what you have and, and bringing it to the world. And that finally, accomplishment in one's career or public life comes not so much at the expense of the other parts, but rather because of the commitments that you have to the different parts of your life. And you can develop these skills if, if you focus on, on doing so. And I hope that you'll continue to do that. So thanks for joining us today and, and for your attention. And thanks again, Ashley, for inviting me. Thank you all.